Good afternoon, and welcome to Smithsonian Gardens webinar series, Let's Talk Gardens. This is a great time to learn more about gardens in our area, gardens around the United States, and techniques that are going to make your brown thumb a little bit greener. My name is Cindy Brown. I'm the Education and Collections Manager at Smithsonian Gardens, and it's my pleasure to introduce and engage our speakers every week. Today, we have a fabulous speaker, and I am sure you're going to learn a lot about the Washington National Cathedral that you've never even heard of before. As usual, if you'd please put your questions in the chat box, we will ask them to the speaker at the end of the presentation. And as always, I'm so appreciative of your support by watching our webinars and by engaging us through emails and all kinds of questions. It's really been fun, and I thank you for that. So without further ado, our speaker this afternoon from the Washington National Cathedral is Sandy Flowers, the Director of Horticulture at the, at the Gardens. So Sandy, why don't you engage us with some information about the gardens and then tell us about your divine inspirations and not so maybe more devilish challenges that you have. I'll see you at the end of your presentation and come back on to ask you all kinds of great questions from our audience. See you in a bit. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. <laughs> um, they're not so devilish. They're just earthly challenges. Welcome everyone on this fine autumn day on the last day of September in 2021. My name is Sandy Flowers and I'm the Director of Horticulture and Grounds for the Washington National Cathedral in Washington, DC. We are located at the intersection of Massachusetts and Wisconsin Avenues Northwest on what is known as Mount St. Albans. Our gardens and grounds at the cathedral are free and open to the public from dawn to dusk. The 57 acre property includes the cathedral and three schools, St. Albans Boys School, which is four through 12, NCS, which is the National Cathedral School, is the girls school four through 12, and Beauvoir, the National Cathedral Elementary School, pre-K through third grade. Our gardening staff, work for the <clears throat> PECF, the Protestant Episcopal Cathedral Foundation, which includes the institutions of higher learning, which are the schools and the cathedral. So we take care of school grounds as well as the cathedral grounds. Our staff currently numbers 16. There are five zone gardeners, two flex gardeners who assist zone gardeners, four turf team members, a St. Albans athletic field groundskeeper, an irrigation specialist, a part-time mechanic to keep our equipment running, and a director and an assistant director. I am lucky to have a wonderful dedicated staff who work diligently through heat, cold, rain, and snow. They make the cathedral gardens and my life beautiful. My time here, which has been eight years now, has been very short in the long timeline of this historic garden. I stand on the shoulders of many inspired and hardworking gardeners and directors before me. Three past directors are still working in prominent horticulture positions in our area. I'd like to give a shout out to Ray Mims at the USBG, Maureen Alonso at GSA, and Joe Lukey also at GSA. I'm thankful for the amazing hard work and many renovations that came before me. And with that, I will move on to the inspiration and challenges of the Washington National Cathedral Gardens. The grounds of a cathedral are called a close. You get to learn a whole new vocabulary when you work at a cathedral. So now I can talk about apps and garths and, and the close, of course. So the close was designed by the well-known landscape architect on the left, Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. Uh, you may know that his father um, 
Olmsted Sr. designed Central Park in New York City, among many other works. Olmsted Jr. worked with landscape designer Florence Brown Bratnall, who's the um, woman on the right. She was a skilled artist and wife of, the, uh, of George C.F. Bratnall, Dean of the Cathedral from 1915 to 1936. So this was in the years that the gardens were being built. Olmsted Jr. designed the Cathedral Close to be a park-like setting. He was very involved in developing the national park system and urban planning for cities. We owe the National Mall and Rock Creek Park to his genius as well. This is the revised landscape plan from 1930. And uh, we are so thankful for his planning to provide a five acre native woods on, uh, as part of the Cathedral Close. And you can see with my arrow, this is the five acre native woods that are still here today, a uh, hundred years later. There is also, it says proposed amphitheater here, and there is an actual amphitheater in that location as well. He also um, uh, planned a mature oak, uh, oak groves on the west front to make that a very park-like setting up by Wisconsin Avenue. Now this was the um, design for the Bishop's Garden itself. And this was the, a drawing done by uh, Florence Brown Bratnall herself. And um, as we look at the design and then look at the garden, you can see how closely it followed that original design. Uh, while her husband oversaw the construction of the cathedral, Florence Bratnall was raising two small boys and focusing her attention on the development of the Bishop's Garden. The Bishop's Garden lies to the south side of the cathedral, and it's a terraced garden built into the hillside as it slopes away from the cathedral. So um, Florence Bratnall was envisioning a garden for the ages made primarily of boxwood, yew, holly, and ivy, very old world evergreen plant material. The garden correspondence between Olmsted and Bratnall was going on in the early 1920s. Everything was done according to Olmsted's plans with periodic supervision by him or someone else from his firm. The Bishop's Garden was finished, and I'm using air quotes here, in time for the general convention of the Episcopal Church, which was in October of 1928. Um, and I use air quote on finished because a garden is never finished. It's a living and growing entity. And as we go along today, you'll see how the garden continued to grow and evolve. So there were some early challenges to the inspiration for this garden. One of them was what on earth to do with all the soil that was coming out when the crypts and the sub crypts and the foundations were dug for the cathedral. So here you see, um, this is in, uh, uh, you know, in the early 1920s, they're building the upper wall of, to retaining wall for the, um, for the Bishop's Garden. Here's the lower wall, um, the foundation having been dug here. And you can see how much more rural the area around the cathedral was in that day and time than it is now. This building, um, uh, octagonal shaped building was an was a baptistery at first and later became the herb cottage. This building behind here was the bishop's uh, residence at the time and is now um, called church house and is the bishop's offices. So we have we have some we have to do something with all of this soil. And here they are working. You can see that the cathedral is in construction up above. They've got in there, they've got the wall working, and here are the men um, moving that enormous amount of soil. Um, one thing you might notice missing from this picture is the absence of large earth moving machines. So these are human beings moving the soil with shovels. The second challenge was where to get and how to pay for mature plant material and stone 
and stones to make the garden look as though it had always been there. So Florence Brattenall, here she is standing, uh, addressing an All Hallows Guild meeting in 1925. She worked to find donors and donated stone and plant material from nearby abandoned estates. She was not, however, working by herself. The All Hallows Guild had been formed in 1916 with the purpose of providing for the care and beautification of the cathedral close. The All Hallows Guild has continued for over a hundred years to support our gardens and grounds. Like gardens, the All Hallows Guild continues to grow and evolve. So this hardworking network of people uh, the All Hallows Guild reached out and they found garden clubs willing to donate. They found the abandoned estates that were willing to donate established boxwood and other material. So for example, this giant boxwood was donated um, and moved from an estate to the cathedral. So you can imagine some of the effort that went into uh, this work. And here, Mr. Charles H. Merriman came in. He was a landscape contractor working on the gardens from 1926 to 1928. He then became the superintendent of grounds in 1929. So Merriman took his crew out. Sometimes they were traveling for days, dug up the donated plants and brought them back to the cathedral to plant. No small task. And here we see the cathedral gardens beginning with one retaining wall and a small circle of boxwood. So kind of interesting, isn't it? The small circle of boxwood becomes a circle within a square of boxwood. And this is the beginning of the hortalus or the little garden, which was an herb garden inspired by Strabo's ninth century book by the same name called Hortalus. Um, I'd like to draw your attention to all the boxwood that is all the way around the perimeter here, as well as in this square and circle. And notice this bird bath right there. The bird bath um, by uh, 1926 had been replaced by a 14th century Carolinian baptismal font from France. And if you look at all the boxwood he now here, it looks almost like a boxwood nursery to me. Here's one of the original old um, ewes that was donated from, uh, from an old uh, estate. And you can see how large that was already in the 1920s. So the baptismal font was the first of a number of medieval sculptures and architectural fragments that Florence Brattenall obtained from the collection of George Gray Barnard. Barnard was an American sculptor. He was trained in Paris, and he also collected medieval architectural pieces from France before World War I. The majority of his collection is now housed at the Cloisters in New York City, part of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, but our Bishop's Garden, uh, luckily, um, has a number of these religious bas reliefs in the wall, in the garden walls, a Norman arch entrance, which we'll see a little bit later on, a Norman car court, a wayside cross, and a birdbath and a sundial um, that is uh, made from an ancient uh, French column capital. So, a major challenge that has persisted through the years uh, in the Bishop's Garden um, and actually all around the close uh, resulted from the choice of plant material and its specific maintenance requirements. The mainstay of the Bishop's Garden was boxwood and plenty of it. So here you see this poor lone gardener pruning boxwood in the late 20s, uh, 1920s, and early 1930s. And you can hear him thinking, one down, 600 to go. This has continued to be uh, the case. Here, we're gonna fast forward 100 years and we see our Bishop's gardener, uh, Addie Schaff, uh, pruning boxwood. And she's pruning out the 
leaf miner damage and ice damage from uh, a, the, a hard winter that year. So one down, 600 to go. We're still doing the same thing. The original boxwood was mainly English box, Boxus sofruticosa. And in some cases, the shrubs coming from the old estates were nearly 100 years old when they were put into the Bishop's Garden in the mid 1920s. So again, if we fast forward another 100 years and the English boxwood was declining, it was partly due to age, partly to heavy snow damage, partly to cultural issues, such as the heat and humidity of our mid-Atlantic region and overhead sprinklers, which boxwoods do not like. So the steadily declining boxwood had the All Hallows Guild and the horticultural staff already planning a large scale Bishop's Garden renovation in 2010. But before it could be executed, the next challenge came, not one usually experienced in the mid-Atlantic region. A 5.8 earthquake shook the region in 2011. It damaged the cathedral itself with the pinnacles being knocked off of their center and statuary falling. The garden, however, was not badly damaged until a crane attempting to stabilize the damaged pinnacles collapsed and it fell all along the up, upper south road and the upper side of the Bishop's garden. Luckily, no one was seriously injured, but the garden didn't fare so well. Mature trees were splintered. The Norman Arch entrance was damaged, as well as stone walls, the herb cottage, and plantings in front of Church House. This gave then Director of Horticulture Joe Lukey unexpected urgency for moving along with the proposed garden renovations. So the arch was lovingly restored by our own cathedral masons. The magnolia and other trees, including a Sephora, weeping cherry, crabapple and holly that were damaged were replaced. And you see, we have another, another crane in here um, that must have given them a little bit of a nervous moment too. Um, this area, was once called the Memory Garden at the east end of the Bishop's Garden. It was redesigned by landscape architect Michael Ferguson as the finial garden. And he used one of the finials that was broken by the earthquake as a memorial to this time in the garden's history. This use of an artifact from the cathedral itself echoed the earlier use of medieval artifacts and fit in seamlessly with the older Bishop's Garden plan without looking out of place or looking too modern. During this renovation, the Wayside Cross, which is the artifact here, um, was moved. It had been in the upper border and during uh, researching, it had revealed that the Wayside Cross originally sat in this location at the head of the Rose Garden. So it was moved um, back to this location. Uh, the wayside crosses in, were used to mark in Europe to mark the path of pilgrimages. And so this is, they also called it a wheel cross or a Celtic cross. It has IHS in the center, which um, was the sacred monogram of Jesus Christ. And the Latin inscription around the outer edge says, our soul is humbled even unto the dust. Now, previously in this location had been, uh, for 50 years had been the prodigal son statue. It, it was displayed in the Bishop's garden during an exhibition of modern religious art uh, in the 1960s and was purchased and donated to the Bishop's Garden in 1961. It sat in that, as I said, in that wayside cross location for 50 years. So many of you who might have been used to that and come back after this renovation go, where's the prodigal son statue? 
Well, it was moved to uh, a more appropriate sheltered location under a weeping cherry by the lower wall. And it has its own garden bed called the prodigal sunbed. At this time, the upper border was also renovated. By now, I was the bishop's gardener, and I enjoyed the collaborative work with Joe Lubke and Tony Kisslier of selecting plants for this border. We were working to get more four season interest, um, which we did manage to do. And we also had a lot of fun creating some lovely plant combinations. Here you see uh, the German iris fortunate sun with verbascum southern charm. And later in the season, we have some bright colored dahlias. This on the left is um, the dahlia Japanese bishop. And this is the dahlia happy single date with Pete's, both of them with Pete's purple aster in the background. Now Pete's purple aster has a bit of a history of its own. Um, it came to the Bishop's Garden Upper Border from the garden of Pete McLaughlin, who was the head gardener for 30 years at the, at the Bishop's Garden, uh, 1961 to 1992. And this garden was in his own home, this uh, aster was in his own home garden, and he brought it into the cathedral. So don't go looking for it in nurseries. It's not anywhere except in our border. And we named it Pete's Purple in his honor. So you, in order to see it, you have to come experience the border um, during the fall. The upper, uh, the older Sofruticosa boxwood were replaced by a cultivar called Green Beauty. And here you see them looking very teeny tiny um, when they were first put in, in 2014. The old ewes from the ewe walk that had been transplanted from other uh, old abandoned estates uh, never were really happy in our mid-Atlantic climate. They had been repeatedly replaced over the years. So in the renovation of the garden in 2013, the ewes were replaced by um, Juniper Virginiana Idlewild, which has the same upright look as an Irish yew, um, but they are, here they are getting a little bit larger. Um, they are more, they have more native hardiness for our climate and the birds love to nest in them and eat the beautiful blueberries in late winter. So here you see both the Idlewilds and the green beauty uh, in uh, 2020 as they're beginning to mature and the garden is taking on um, not such a, a young look again. The Hortalus herb garden was also completely dug up and replanted in 2014 also. And here you see um, the Iris Florentina, which is now classified because they cannot leave names alone, uh, now classified as Iris Germanica Nothovar. It is the source of orris root, which was used in perfumes, soaps, washing powders. Um, it was also used medicinally in medieval times. So all the, all the herbs in this little hortalus um, were available in ninth century monasteries. And uh, so we restored it back to the only that uh, time period of medicinal herbs. Once the renovation of the Bishop's Garden was completed in 2014, we moved outward to other areas of the close. Some garden areas of the cathedral have been renovated multiple times, simply due to plantings aging out and needing refreshed. The Nitsa Garden um, was one of these areas. It was originally installed in 1988 uh, to commemorate Phyllis Pratt Nitza and her dedication as an All Hallows Guild member and past president. It's, an, it's a sloping garden. It has appealing views of the cathedral and it's in a quieter location than the Bishop's Garden. Here it is overgrown um, from, uh, 
this this version you're looking at was in uh, 2018, but had been planted 15 years earlier. Um, the wall above the garden was also collapsing. And so it was time for a renovation. All Hallows Guild took on uh, the restoration of the walls and the, re and the renovation of the garden as an All Hallows Guild garden project. As you remember, All Hallows Guild is the volunteer organ organization formed in 1916 to raise funds to create and maintain the gardens of the Cathedral Close. We on the horticulture staff work closely with them, performing or overseeing the actual labor to affect the renovations um, or, or overseeing a contractor, um, which we were doing with this wall. We brought in a stone, stone company to do the wall. Um, but we were, we were always so thankful to All Hallows Guild for their efforts on our behalf. The gardens of the close would be less beautiful by far without their help. The, 19, uh, the 2019 renovation was designed by Addie Schaff, who's our um, bishop's gardener. And she used a diversity of plants, both native and non-native. We're always seeking ways to bring more native plants into uh, areas on the close. And uh, we were seeking to also provide four season interest. Notice the sloping topography of this garden, which is common on the close being built on Mount St. Albans. It makes for many challenging erosion and maintenance issues. Your legs ache for days when working on hills like this. And you can imagine the challenge that our guys had to bring these trees up that hill um, to plant them. Here are summer interns are mulching the new garden with shredded leaf mulch. Uh, our summer interns are also funded by the All Hallows Guild. This is the first year of the new garden, uh, garden renovation and you're seeing um, hydrangea arborescence, incredible ruby blooming. Um, and we wanna show a, as well as some other plants in there, we wanna show one of our favorite features, which is this Hakanakloa River tumbling down the hillside and reflecting light in the shaded area. The, um, this is Hakanakloa all gold and the, and the um, hydrangea is the arborescence incredible, incredible ruby. So this, this little Hakanakloa River holds interest even in the winter time. And the birds like to pull, pull early spring, they like to pull it up and take it and make nests with it. Constructions on, construction on the close creates an immediate need for renovation and it seems never to end. The cathedral itself was 43 years of construction in the making being completed in 1990, which actually is not that long as cathedrals go. But I am really glad I was not here to see the disruption caused by the construction of the underground garage, 2005 to 2007. My heart might not have been able to take this, <laughs> to see the whole area just completely denuded. It, it looks completely different today. But on a smaller, more recent level, gas lines were brought in to each of the schools in the past year. They brought into the schools, the cathedral and church house. At first, the church house gas line didn't look like it was gonna to be too bad of a disruption until suddenly excavators were working like crazy and the holes were getting ever larger. As always, when heavy equipment is involved, the ground never really recovers from the resulting compacted earth. So you see after a, a rain here, the water does not perk through the damaged soil. So even though we augured holes into the compacted earth and we amended as best we could with leaf grow and permatil, and then we planted, alas, we still lost this liquid amber happy days, which we loved, and the um, Circus, the red bud rising sun due to the compacted soil not draining well. So we're gonna have to find two trees that can take that kind of um, underground abuse. Church House is, a, is an example of about half a dozen construction related 
renovations on the close in the past few years. There's not time here to go through each of these, but every year we're designing, sourcing plants and planting somewhere on the close. Events also cause significant impacts on the grounds. Over the, year, <clears throat> over the years, events have increased and become larger. And this is a common problem for parks and botanic gardens that were designed in the last century. These gardens were not designed to accommodate the level of foot traffic and large tented events that are common in our century. Trucks and heavy equipment bringing in these tents uh, compact the soil and setting up and taking down. And uh, the grass is, uh, of course, prevented from getting sunlight for the length of the time the tents are up. And dog tracks inevitably come around the areas where bars or buffets are set up. Um, and it takes an amazing number of years to uh, rework the turf to get to get them to come back if you even can sometimes we just have to resod outdoor tents were also had to be used as a solution for social distancing and outdoor classrooms during the pandemic the grass was completely gone after a year of tenting on the north lawn so here we are just a few weeks ago resodding that area after a year of tents we hope the compaction is not too severe to inhibit the future health of the turf in this area. One event that has been going on for more than 80 years at the cathedral, and that is Flower Mart. Flower Mart is the All Hallows Guild fundraiser for the Gardens of the Close. Here it is in 1942, held just on the Pilgrim Steps. Now it has expanded and takes up uh, South Road, the West Front, the North Lawn. Um, it is held, Flower Mart is held on the first Friday and Saturday of May, heralding spring and encouraging everyone to buy plants, make their own gardens thrive. We also set up the All Hallows Guild Antique Carousel, which is the joy of children and adults alike. Here I am on my first carousel rodeo. Our garden staff sets up and runs the carousel each year. Uh, this is something they don't teach in horticulture classes. Unfortunately, so it's, you know, we get fun experiences here. Uh, unfortunately, the pandemic has caused Flower Mart to be canceled for the last two years. We're hoping to see it back in 2022, and we hope that you will join us. All Hallows Guild sponsors the premier plant sales to sell plants each year. Another common uh, garden challenge in our area, some you might be familiar with this, are critters. We have plenty of rabbits, which are very destructive to the gardens. When pe people come in and coo over them and say, aren't they cute? We encourage them to please take some home. Of course, we also have deer damage. And this gal thinks she lives at the Dean's residence, but she's not alone. Where there's one, there's always more. We do try to teach the young ones to use the crosswalks, however. Now here's a, here's a creature that most of you do not see in your gardens, and that is Aladdin the camel. And this is not a new method of cutting grass and fertilizing at the same time. What this is, is the filming of a live nativity scene last December. So thus we have a camel and three wise men traveling across the Bishop's Garden lawn, proving that life is never dull on the cathedral close. And if you're the Bishop's Gardener, you frequently find yourself with other duties as assigned. Here our horticulturist becomes a shepherdess. I would like to close this talk with one of our newer challenges uh, that we have turned into an opportunity. This one is not a renovation, but an innovation. This area across from the um, NCS, the National Cathedral School Athletic Center, 
was a barren slope of nothing but mulch. The upper view, uh, you, can, you know, seeing down the hill, you can see that it is truly uh, underutilized horticulturally, which might be an understatement. Um, we didn't want just another traditional shrub border. Um, so in 2018, we engaged our clever and creative uh, summer interns, Alex Anthony on the left, Nathan Wade in the middle, and Donna De Los Santos on the right in an intern project to design a pollinator garden for this space. One of our in, oh, this is the, the this is their design that they came up with. And um, we, Addie and myself gave input and direction um, and they studied and developed the plan. One of our interns, Nathan Wade, came back on his spring break because he wanted to help us actually plant the garden. All Hallows Guild enthusiastically supported and funded the new garden and the National Cathedral School embraced it for this location. So here it is, newly planted in 2019. We planted this with some one gallon, some plants were in one gallon pots, but a lot of them were actually um, plugs, landscape plugs. And uh, I was interested to see how, how well they would come on. Here we are, uh, first summer, 2019, they're moving along pretty well. And then another year, summer 2020, it was amazing how quickly it took hold. Here we have uh, Pycnanthemum muticum, mountain mint, uh, Asclepius tuberosa. We have Rudbeckia laciniata and um, Echinacea powwow wildberry, Hypericum blues festival, uh, Phlox subulata for the early spring, purple beauty. Um, this is a geranium, Bevins, um, Bevins variety. Don't try and write all this down because we have given you a list of which plants um, we put in the, in the pollinator garden as a resource for you. And the helpful information that Addie added was she lists which plants serve as host plants for various butterflies and moths. So that is um, a resource that, that will uh, be available to you, um, you know, with, along with this talk. So now in 2021, what a wonderful difference uh, taking this underutilized area and making it both an ecological and aesthetic plus. The NCS and Beauvoir students love to walk this path and see the busy pollinators at work. So though we try to keep the historic part of the cathedral gardens close to their original design, we are trying to incorporate diverse and ecologically positive plant choices where possible, especially at the schools and in the woods. We like to think that Florence Bratnall would be doing the same thing if she was still gardening with us. Thankfully, Olmsted Jr. presciently provided us with a five acre woods, which helps us to ecologically balance in a small way the tremendous human development that has occurred in our area over the years. The All Hallows Guild is working with us to preserve this incredibly important part of the cathedral close. We hope you'll stop by when you're in Northwest Washington, DC and visit us in the gardens of the Cathedral Close. Take time to walk through the Olmsted Woods and enjoy the quiet reflection available in these timeless spaces. And if you can't join us in person, there are virtual tours on the All Hallows Guild website. So I have provided you here with my email and the websites for both the All Hallows Guild and the Cathedral. You'll find more information about the gardens on the All Hallows Guild website 
and information and a timeline of the cathedral uh, and what was happening over the years um, as the cathedral was being built on the cathedral website. So I have enjoyed being here with you and I thank you, uh, Cindy, I'm gonna turn yes. it back to you. Thank you, Sandy. That was just terrific. Uh, for people that don't know what it's like to do these webinars, it is incredibly challenging. Uh, and Sandy, thank you. That was your first try at doing a webinar. I hope you do many, many more. It's such great information to be able to share with us. Uh, we appreciate it. I didn't know the history for the boxwood was as uh, d deep as what you were telling us. So we do have a number of questions. One thing, this is an easy one. How many acres do you have? 57. 57. Uh, 57 how, acres. Okay. And uh, how many are really actively cultivated within those 57? Or that might be the cultivation. Well, the five acre woods um, is not included, in, well, is included in that 57 acres. Okay. Um, and we're, we work in them, we're, we're working very much uh, in removing invasives, primarily pulling English ivy out, and as we pull the ivy out of the woods, we find uh, the native uh, ground covers are coming back like the may apples, the erythronium, trillium. Um, but it does take work to get rid of that English ivy and tree of heaven and mm -hmm. you know all the other invasives that have come into any uh, area. But 57 acres, um, you know, there's buildings of course, the schools and the cathedral are on that 57 acres, but mm -hmm. uh, we actively have to garden and weed and take care of, of the grounds. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. excellent. And we're getting questions, where can they find the list of pollinator plants? And that's for us. Uh, when Sandy's uh, web uh, video goes up on our website at gardens.si.edu, we'll also put her resource pages up there. Uh, so you'll be able to get that list and learn more about the different pollinator plants, which I really applaud. Uh, that's something that we promote greatly at Smithsonian Garden. So it's wonderful to see you're educating the students as they walk through that beautiful, beautiful garden, instead of wondering if the mulch is gonna fall in the pathway and uh, block them from getting into their classes. So that's great. So the list of pollinator plants will be put on our website along with Sandy's video in about two weeks. It takes about that long to process everything uh, through it. But I've got a number of questions. The giant boxwood that it, you showed at the very beginning of your presentation, is that still there? Does it still exist or no? No, no, it, okay. it does not, yeah. We'll say a little it, prayer for it then. Yes, for we say prayers question. for all the, old, all the old things that can't come and go, but yes. Yeah, you're gonna have to say a prayer for me here pretty soon. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but does boxwood have a deeper spiritual meaning? Is that why they included it in the Bishop's Garden or just a traditional plant? Well, m most of the cathedrals of Europe, uh, you know, a lot of them are in England. And English boxwood, of course, was, you know, was around. Uh, there probably is some spiritual, uh, you know, reason also, but I can't think of it right at the moment. Um, uh, it, it, it's just a, an old world plant and cathedrals or old world buildings um, kind of went together. Um, and plus, plus, if you put boxwood in, it fills up a lot of space, you know, yes, it does. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, sure. and you need to with a building as large as the cathedral, if you put small little plants, um, you know, they are even more dwarfed. Mm -hmm. um, we have very huge magnolias and huge American hollies um, that if you saw them next to a house, you'd think, oh my gosh, that thing is enormous. But you see it up against the cathedral and it looks small. It looks like a foundation mm -hmm. planting. Yeah, mm -hmm. so. That's a good design tip for all of us. Well, not me, but for all of those that have giant houses, uh, you know, and you have a tiny little walkway and tiny little plants, just doesn't do the same thing. So I like how you thought big, uh, or the the beginning gardeners somebody thought big. Somebody else thought and, yeah, big. Somebody else me. thought big. But you continue <laughs> to think big, which is yeah. good. Um, are there any of the original boxwood surviving? There are still some. Yes, okay. there are, and they're in the bishop's garden still. Um, and there are some around the cathedral itself. Most of those are American boxed uh, rather than English. 
Um, the ones on the south side, uh, uh, there are still some there. And, uh, and we still have some of the Sofruticosa in, in the, alongside the um, Bishop's Garden Lawn um, and a few other places. There, you know, so we we're, can go visit them. Yeah, we're slow to take slow to take them out because of their historic, you know, value. Um, but with boxwood um, blight coming in, which is a, a mm -hmm. disease of boxwood, uh, that it attacks Sofruticosa, the English box, more readily than some of the cult new cultivars. And so uh, in some cases, we will remove it just because we're, we don't want to bring boxwood blight into the garden. We're knock on, knock on wood. We don't have it. We ha have not experienced it yet in the Bishop's garden because if it, you know, some areas have gotten boxwood blight mm -hmm. and it just wipes out the entire mm -hmm. garden. Yeah. Um, so we're lucky we have not had that happen yet. Well, somebody uh, did Google what boxwood in, in spiritual meetings it would, and it sounds like it's a symbol of immortality. I know it is also a symbol of strength too, because of the wood and the wood oh, is yes. used for carvings for so many uh, different things that would have been used in the cathedrals as well as would have been used in everyday like, pipes and canes and that type thing. So it's not strong enough to be able to build a building out of, but it is a delightful wood to be able to use for ornamental reasons, uh, that type thing. So that's true. It's a very hard wood. It's mm -hmm. a very hard wood. If you've ever tried to cut one down, you know yes. exactly what you're going to get into. Exactly. So that's terrific. Okay. Question two was small a, a visitor was there in spring and was walking around the grounds and noticed these small blue flowers underneath the trees and in open lawn area do you know what they might be i mean that's Ipion. like oh Ipion. Ipion. oh okay yeah. Yep. yeah yeah okay. yeah it's a bulb excellent. yep excellent boy it sounds like it's really naturalized in yes the it has. Yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah it's been it's been in there a long time so it's had plenty of time to move around yeah. Mm -hmm. And the color blue is so symbolic, so spiritual because of the color of Mary's cloak in references uh, for so many different things. So I'm sure there's a lot of symbolism in the plants that are around in the Bishop's Garden. Oh, yeah. Uh, yes. And I'm like, oh, here's the other one. Rotating deep root. Have you considered rotating deep root prairie grasses to help rehabilitate the compacted soil? Have not. Um, uh, I, simply because a lot of the areas are in, uh, like that one right in front of Church House is um, is you know so front and center to put prairie grasses in there might be a little um, you know not appreciated maybe by people, um, but that is you know there are different plants that you can plant to to do that to break up soil. It works very very well in a natural a natural area or an area like our pollinator garden where we can you know have something like that that looks a little bit uh, looser. We're trying to get people more used to the looser aesthetic, a little bit of a challenge in our medieval garden <laughs> setting. It is, but yeah, prairie grasses would probably be better accepted than something like daikon radishes or the <laughs> sugar beets. <laughs> And they break up uh, compacted soil too, yeah, but I think they that would do. be a really different look for you. Uh, yeah, daikon sure radishes that. in front of yeah. the cathedral. Especially when they started to rot in the spring when they were freezing mm, and thawing too much. Maybe not too much, but it's a good maybe thing not. for you to try at home. If you're trying to put yeah. it in a vegetable garden, think about using daikon radishes right now, plant them so that they start breaking up the soil over the winter for you. So that's, that's another yeah. thing that you can or consider. Yeah. Ray, Moulton, Ray Moulton Tree Farm up in Adamstown, Maryland, uses daikon radishes in, in between the, the tree rows to break up the soil. Oh, mm. that's a very good idea. I didn't, that, I, I'll have to try that next time. That sounds great when I get my farm that I can do as many plantings as I want to. Yeah. So uh, we have another question. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm looking back and forth. I want to look you in the eyes all the time, but I'm... I'm looking back and forth so i can't do this maybe you can do this can you spell epiphion the blue flower epiphion 
if I, not, I, I, there's a P in there. <laughs> yeah, there's a PH. Uh, I have to write it. I okay. P H if I P H E O N. I think there's an I in there that I'm missing. There is an I in there that I do okay. know. Okay. Well, there's a, the first. It starts with an I. I P H I E O N. Mm, something okay. like that. There that, and that'll get you close enough for Google to pick it up. Yes, it's I P H E I O N. E I O N. Okay. E I O N. I I never try to spell because I'm a really terrible speller, uh, so I have to Google everything and make sure before I go through it. So you showed us some beautiful new things that you're doing with pollinators. Are you? Do you offer classes? at the cathedral to teach more about uh, gardening? We don't have classes um, at this point. Uh, um, we just really don't have the staff to, uh, you know, to take the time to develop classes and give them. Um, we do have some, uh, we do have tours, garden tours um, that uh, the All Hallows Guild runs. Um, and uh, they have, of course, we're stopped during the pandemic, mm -hmm. um, but they just had the first one started back up uh, last a couple of weeks ago. Um, and so, you know, tours with that kind of information might be a way to come and learn. But um, uh, no, we haven't had any classes. Sorry. Well, there's something to think about in the future. Yeah. To see what goes on. That would be great because I know that the gardens are absolutely beautiful and everyone would love to learn more from you and from your staff and it'd be terrific. Uh, it's something to take to the All, All Hallows Guild and see what they say too, and that would be great. But we are so very lucky in this area that we have so many beautiful gardens and there's multiple uh, um, comments in the, the chat on how many people have appreciated walking the grounds through the years and we are it's so lucky in the Washington DC area with the gardens that we have and the talent that we have to be able to tend those gardens. So we thank you and your staff for keeping it looking absolutely delightful. And we're so sorry that you might have some challenges, but I, I can tell you, I know I've never had a camel in my garden. So <laughs> <laughs> that must have been uh, fun. <laughs> it, was, it was very fun because he didn't want to leave. Oh. Um, he liked it there and so they they had a real struggle getting him out uh <laughs> recalcitrant camels yes. um yes like that but it uh it during the pandemic too um the our gardens because they're open uh all the time uh have just been a haven for so many of the people who live in this area around us so many people were stuck in their apartments doing you know uh zoom meetings yeah <laughs> and uh and uh they would get out for lunch and come to the come to the bishop's garden go for strolls in the morning and in the evening um so our visitation really increased during um, this past time when people really were taking refuge in the out of doors. So yeah. that was a good thing. That is a good thing. And we found that, uh, I've heard that comment all around, uh, that the pandemic really brought people to the gardens. Gardens are so very important for our mental health, our mental well-being. Uh, and so we do encourage you to come and visit all of the gardens in the Washington area. And wherever you are, if you're not in the Washington area, please seek out your gardens because it's wonderful to be able to have that resource. And don't just seek them out, help support them too, because it's something that uh, gardens uh, are not always recipients of wonderful grants or, or um, uh, big dollars to go along with it. So it's wonderful to support your local gardens always with your presence, your uh, comments, and of course, always uh, the other resources that come along with that. So Sandy, everybody's thanking you. I'm gonna thank you. Greatly appreciated. Well, it was fun to be here and fun to join you all. Um, I do wanna say that the cathedral itself is not open yet. Um, it's open for Sunday services, I think at 11. 
Um, but at the moment, the cathedral itself is not open. So if you come, you'll be visiting the grounds and not be able to go into the cathedral until such time as they're able to, um, to open it up again. So okay. just to let you know, so don't want anybody to be disappointed. Yes. Yes, that's a very good thing not to be disappointed. You don't have greenhouses any longer, do you? Or I know they're not open to the public. So, no, yeah. we don't yeah. have them at all. That's what I thought. Um, I remember that they yeah. disappearing. So that was another question. Could they visit the greenhouses? Uh, I wish you could. No. I wish you could. I wish we had them. Um, yes, they they were deteriorating like the boxwood um, from age. And um, and it was just decided uh, Yeah, there was a point where um, there weren't funds to to replace them. And it was decided to take them down. Um, I I miss them every day of my life here <laughs> because <laughs> I could really I could really benefit from them but uh to, you know we could grow a lot of things but um uh, anyway it's a yeah. it is what it is one last question and I'm going to let you yeah. go the Hakanakloa I yes the, the that's the little the, the low green it was Hakanakloa aria all gold correct all gold correct yes okay so I can't spell. I can, I, can oh. I can do it. Okay, good. You spell it. I'll type it. Wait a minute. Okay. H A H A K O N O N E C L O A. Hakanakloa. Oh, Aria. I can spell. Yeah. And all gold. You got that. All gold. They, many people call it Hakoni. Hakoni grass. So that tells you how to spell the first part, H A C O N E, and then you add the cloa, okay. C H O L O A. Um, it's Japanese forest grass. It is not native, which is unfortunate, but um, it is just really a, a, a wonderful texture and color uh, to add into uh, shade gardens. It, it is one of the few grasses that wants to be in the shade. It'll burn up pretty badly if it's in the full sun. Mm -hmm. We do have some natives too. We have some carexes that like. Oh yes, that's shade, true. We so. do have car carexes. Yeah, that's so right. that's a fun thing to be able to plant as well. So Sandy, thank you for making our lives beautiful. Thank you for taking such beautiful care of those gardens, and thank you for sharing them with us today. And I will be the speaker next week. So if you want to tune in and uh, participate in the part two of seed saving. That's what we're going to talk about next week. And that's a really important thing to do at this time of the year so that you can increase your gardens as well as many other benefits. So we'll see you all next week. And thanks again for everyone for joining us today. Bye-bye, Sandy. Bye-bye. Thanks. See you later. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.